Hey everyone, it's the Procrastinating Professor and today we're going to be painting a Black Bull Wood Elf starting with a black undercoat and Sherwood Green as the base coat. I decided fairly early on that I wanted a contrasting paint job, so in this case I've selected a light green which is slightly in the yellow range and then I'm going to contrast that with a little bit of purple which is going to be a little bit more, well I'm going to be using a slightly more pinkish shade of purple. Sherwood Green is a fairly light color and when you're working on light colors over a dark undercoat, you're definitely going to have to build it up in a couple of layers. Now a big reason why I'm even doing this by hand is simply because someone asked me, why don't I just give tutorials about painting without an airbrush? And I was like, yeah, well, we can definitely do that. I tend to use an airbrush simply because when I'm painting large armies and a lot of models, of course, the airbrush does save quite a lot of time. But it's fine, we can definitely use a paintbrush in this situation. So you can see me building up the color again and again. It's very important that when you want to start with a good paint job, understandably you have to get a good base coat down first. Some of you are probably wondering, why didn't you start with a white undercoat? But here's the thing, right? I wanted a very strongly contrasting miniature. And in that sort of situation, because there's going to be a lot of shadows, it's actually going to be better to start with a darker undercoat. And in this case, I've simply decided to go with black. So that's kind of what the first layer looks like. Essentially, I'm going to use a brighter green now called Fall Green again. I'm sticking to scale 75. And down here, you can see that I'm actually building the highlights at the areas that would pick up light. Now what you're seeing down here is me doing a technique that I'll be using throughout this entire paint job which is a variant of feathering. Essentially what I'm doing is I am painting on the paint and then washing my brush in between as you can see I'm washing my brush and then I'm coming back with a clean brush tip and kind of pushing the wet paint over the surface to kind of blend together the two colors at the interface. Now some of you may be wondering, Prof, why aren't you just doing traditional layering? Well, layering takes time and using this technique, of course, as you can see in my recordings, it's a lot faster to do the blends this way. Now, there is, of course, a downside to this style of painting. First of all, you need to, of course, work pretty fast. If not, your paint is going to dry. In this case, because I'm using acrylics, acrylics dry very fast. And if you do not kind of move the paint fast enough, you're going to end up with these marks where the paint at the edges are going to start drying and it's going to be a little bit of a mess. Now, again, if you want to use retarder, you can. But remember that you're not supposed to use too much retarder because the retarder will affect your paint's properties. So you can put maybe about uh, 5% to 10% of retarder, which is what is recommended by some companies. So you can see the final product down here. And again, if the shades and the highlights at this stage don't look very nice, don't worry about it. That's why we're going to be building this up very slowly, bit by bit. And I also noticed at this stage down here that the lighter green itself, again, wasn't particularly bright. So I decided here to actually add a second layer to it. And again, because we're technically, even though we are in our first highlight, it's technically still almost close to the base. And it's very important to make sure that the colors truly stand out quite a bit. And yes, this would probably be faster with an airbrush. But again, the whole point down here is to show that it can be done with a brush. One of the tricks that I strongly recommend using when you're painting models like this, especially when you're trying to do a very strong contrast, is you need to figure out your light placement early on. Of course, for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm not going to talk about every single point where I decided that the light is on, but you're free to not just observe my paint jobs, but observe the paint jobs of all your favorite artists, or even better, look at actual photographs of real things. And you'll see that certain areas catch more light than others. Another tip that you can actually use is when you start your paint job, you can of course spray your miniature black, for example. And some people go an extra step where they use, for example, gloss varnish, or they just use hard lighting and they take a photo of it just to kind of see where the light placements naturally are. 
In this case, of course, I'm going mostly by feeling. So, for the most part, I think my light bases should be on point. But it won't be surprising if a few of them are a little bit stray here and there, and that's fine. Again, I'm not painting this for display level. This is more kind of just my slightly above average level of paint job for this. I can only afford doing this with a brush because at the end of the day, a Black Bowl team only has a few models. There is no way on earth I'm ever going to paint, for example, an army with this sort of painting style. So you'll see me focusing the light areas on the ridges, on the tips, and in between intermittently you'll notice that I'm washing my brush and I am using my wet brush to move it. The brush is only wet with water. I am not using any other organic solvent or anything like that. So the next color I'm actually using is not Violet Red. I just noticed after I edited the video that I put in a picture of Violet Red instead of Red Leather. I actually used Red Leather for the ball as well as the face. Red Leather is a scale 75 paint. And I'm not going to be showing how I did the leather on the ball for the rest of this paint job simply because I've already shown how to do leather on my other video where I painted my Ogre Man Eater. So you can check it out there. So now I'm actually using Violet Red as my shade. So using the same technique again, I'm just feathering the Violet Red into the shades. Now, some of you may be wondering, why are you painting with greens and purples? Well, here's the thing, right? When you want to do some extreme contrast, very often under many circumstances, they'll teach you that, oh, all you need to do is you need to shade it with a darker shade of the same color. So for example, if you were painting green, you would shade it with maybe a very dark green or maybe you would shade it with black. But if you want it to be artistic and tough, you know, more eye-catching, you need to use different colors. Now, some people say, oh, you got to use complementary colors. And yes, to a certain extent, complementary colors will, of course, give you the strongest contrast. But again, there's no real compulsion to use the most direct complementary colors. So for example, Green's complementary is going to be red. But in this case, I'm not using straight up red. I'm using something that contains a little bit of red. In this case, I'm moving it a little bit more towards the purple. Whereas purple, of course, its complementary is typically going to be around an orangey or a yellow type of color. And in this case, I'm using green. But green does have little bits of yellow in it. So the colors kind of still work, even though they're not necessarily directly complementary. So you can see me feathering it and focusing on the shades. You will notice that I'm actually using this kind of as a transition color between the green as well as the darkest shadows which I'm going to be painting on later. The darkest shadow areas currently are still going to be in black. But later on, I'm going to be using a very dark purple as the final shade. Again, I'm only using water on my brush. You can, of course, replicate this probably a lot easier with enamel paints or oil paints, I guess, because that one gives you a lot more time to manipulate your paints. But those paints also take a lot longer to dry. And of course, you're going to have to use a lot of organic thinners, which maybe perhaps it's not something everyone wants, especially because some of them can be a little bit smelly. Speaking truthfully, this paint job started almost as a joke. My friend was commenting to me that, Hey Prof, since now you are some fancy schmancy YouTuber and Instagram person, maybe perhaps you need to start painting your models in you know, a more mainstream colorful manner to attract people to watch your videos rather than using your more realistic paint job style that you usually use. And I was like, that's not my style, but I can try. <laughs> 
so that's the paint job after applying the violet red. You can see that there is of course a fairly harsh transition between the greens and the violet reds, but that will be fixed later on as we start building up more highlights as well as more shades. So I'm using Nagaroth Knight as my dark purple. You could use another dark purple like royal purple or whatever, it's up to you, but in this case this is what I had lying around. I'm doing the same thing but this time you can notice I'm focusing on the areas where it's going to be the greatest shadow. And again, I'm still using feathering and kind of using my wet brush to push it around. Now, when you are deciding to paint your models, I think it's very important to understand that all the different techniques, be it dry brushing, wet blending, feathering, whatever it is, they're all different techniques. I'm sure that almost everyone is going to use different techniques for different situations. It's important as a painter to understand that these are all just kind of tools in your toolkit. There's no one method that's strictly better than the others. It's just a question of when you're going to be using them. So in this case, for this model, I decided to use feathering simply because I kind of wanted the effects of layering but without actually doing so many layers because I didn't want to invest too much time in this model. This model overall took me about three evenings to paint, which sounds like a lot of time, but when I say three evenings, I'm not saying like 18 hours or anything like that. No, I'm talking like maybe about six hours, something thereabouts to paint. And that's why if you look very closely, of course, it's going to be a little bit crude compared to, of course, what professionals are going to do. I'm not a professional. I do this for fun as a hobby. I make these video recordings kind of as almost a side effect of me painting. I decide ah, I might as well teach people how to paint while I'm painting, right? Now, I also use Nagaroth Knight to start painting on the highlights for my hair as well as the tab art in front of the model. Now, I'm going to be using a combination of pure white, fall green, and Yerel yellow as the second highlight. So in this case, of course, I'm pushing it a little bit into the yellower scheme. This is again in part to make it a little bit more contrasting. You don't have to highlight your greens with yellows. In fact, depending on the sort of green that you're going for, you can always mix your greens with, for example, bones and beiges if you want it to be lighter. Or in some cases, you could also mix it straight up with white. It's up to you. But in this case, because I kind of wanted that extreme contrast, I went with a yellower shade. And you'll notice that, of course, as usual, when we're working with multiple layers of highlights, each subsequent highlight needs to be in a smaller area than the preceding colors. So you can see that I'm only touching on the areas that I wanted the brightest and I'm immediately removing the excess light and kind of blending it together into the underlying greens that we've built up from earlier. Some of the excess green is also going to start to cover over the violet red areas that we had painted earlier on and that's good because again it kind of helps tie it all together. So one strategy that I'm using down here is intentionally not going all the way with all my highlights all at once and then all my shades all at once. What you're seeing me do down here is simply using, knowing that feathering works the way that it is, where there's going to be a bit of bleeding and a little bit of blending going on. I'm leveraging that to also smooth the transition between the violet red and the greens and the lighter greens because as I feather, I'm basically pushing some of my lighter shades over the areas that I painted with violet red, therefore kind of blending it all together a little bit more smoothly. Now working with the pinks and the purples, basically I'm going to be using Warlord Purple. I'm going to be painting it on. You'll notice that I'm trying my best to intentionally leave out the darkest areas. Although very frankly, it doesn't matter. I could have just covered this entire area and then just gone over with my darker colors later on. It wouldn't have really mattered. But this is just me being a little bit funny with the way that I like to do things. 
I've mentioned this previously in one of my other videos, but even though I of course do share the paints that I'm using, you don't have to rush out and buy, for example, Warlord Purple just to replicate my color. Very frankly, if you have any sort of paint in your house that kind of already looks like this, you can just go ahead and use it. And that's always my advice to people who are watching painting tutorials. Don't rush out to buy the paints that your favorite painter is using. Like for me, I just buy paints because I have a problem. I have an issue with collecting paints. It's it's a disease of some sort, I'm, I guess. But I enjoy experimenting with paints. And that's why I own so many paints. I do not recommend spending too much money on buying paints just for one paint job and then just dumping them to the side never to use them again. So I'm also using Wallet Purple to highlight the hairs and you'll notice that in this case it looks almost like I'm dry brushing but I'm not really dry brushing, my brush is still kind of wet, there's still quite a lot of paint down there but I'm just using a very crude method to quickly apply this Wallet Purple and it doesn't really matter simply because later on I am going to be basically using a contrast paint to kind of melt it all together what will happen is that you can still, you'll still be able to see the highlights through the contrast paint but it's going to be a little bit mellowed out by the contrast. Now moving on to my next highlight of Ereal Yellow and Pure White. And again, this is just me pushing it all the way into the yellow spectrum. So again, only focusing on the brightest areas and I am again feathering it over. And you'll see that what happens here, as I mentioned just now, is that the brighter colors will subsequently actually bleed a little bit into the underlying colors. So it's going to bleed into the previous layer and the previous layer is going to bleed into the previous layer and it's going to cover over the violet red. This is how you do feathering if you want like a high contrast paint job. You could use a lot of layers if you wanted to. People sometimes ask me, Prof, do you use a wet palette? I don't. I really don't. You can use it. I have used it many times in the past when I was experimenting but I find that I just have a tendency to kind of mix my paints on my models basically. Now a quick tip for using the feathering technique. For this to actually succeed besides being very fast, you need to make sure that your paints are sufficiently thick. This is something that's a little bit risky because if it's too thick of course you're going to end up a little bit gloopy and if you're thick and you're not fast enough to do the feathering what's going to happen is that you're going to have this blob of paint and it's going to leave this horrible residue where it's all just the underlying layer will basically be peeling off it's very hard to describe but long story short you have to make sure that your paint is sufficiently thick to effectively do feathering but not so thick that you end up adding texture paint dried paint texture to your model that's going to be pretty bad for me the perfect thickness is kind of like a thick cream. Certain types of paints work better with this technique. So for example, all the kind of thicker, more gel-based paints work a little bit better with this technique. So for example, Scale 75 works very well with this. Typical Vallejo paints also work pretty well with this, although not so much the air line. The Vallejo air line is a little bit too thin and there are some issues with using it for feathering under some circumstances. You'll see an example of it going wrong a little bit later on, which I've intentionally left in because I want to show all of you that sometimes the technique doesn't really work that well with certain types of consistencies and certain types of paints. But again, this comes to where sometimes you watch videos where they tell you that certain brands are better than others. Uh, AK is better or Vallejo is better or Reaper is better, whatever the case. The fact is that all these different paints are different. They have different consistencies, they have different opacities and yes, certain brands will do certain colors better than other brands. That might be true. However, from a painter's perspective, use what you have and you over and over time you start to recognize that different paints kind of have different consistencies and you would be able to leverage the difference in consistencies difference in opacities and use those strengths to complement your style so certain paint brands for example they're not very opaque which sounds like a horrible thing to happen if you have a very poor opacity paint but those work pretty well as for example filters or if you want to do layering some paints seem to be really thick out of the pot that sounds really bad but then you realize certain ones of them are easier to blend with. So for example, Scale 75, very easy to blend. Uh, AK, for example, very good overall. For general use, of course, I do recommend some of the paint lines that have a fairly universal consistency as this allows them to be more flexible in how you can use them. So for example, the typical, the, the non-air line of Vallejo uh, or AK paints is starting to become my favorite. Scale 75 is a little bit difficult to use. And of course, you can also use Citadel, there's no harm with that. And I hope 
bunch of other brands out there which I've tried and some of them are pretty good. I sometimes use pore colors, I sometimes use P3. You would have seen a smattering of the different brands that I use as you go through my videos over time. So now I'm going to be using Squid Pink as my lighter pink. And I'm going to be building this on top of my wall of purple. And this paint is the one that I mentioned. It doesn't feather as well. Game air tends to be a little bit thin. So as you can see down here, I've applied the paint. I'm going to attempt to feather it. And you'll see that the paint kind of breaks up. It's not smooth. It has this kind of washed out watercolor. You can kind of see the strokes. It's fairly ugly. And I try to, of course, fix it, try to clear it out. Thankfully, I could because the paint is really, really thin. I did not actually dilute the paint any further. I just used it straight out of the bottle. But as you can see down here, I decided, okay, since it didn't go very well the first time around, I'm just going to apply a second layer after the first layer had dried. And then I'm going to try again. Again, it doesn't really work very well. For Game Air or Vallejo Airlines, I would probably be more inclined to use them, of course, for airbrushing, but also for layering instead. But in this case, because I just wanted to do the whole model with feathering, I just did it this way. I remember many years ago, Privateer Press was pushing this method of painting, which I believe was called the toothbrush technique. Now, that tutorial was a paint tutorial. It was, I think, a video, if I recall correctly, like a VHS or something. This, we're talking like uh, almost 20 years ago, I think, at this stage. I never purchased the video. So all that I have to run off is, are just basically secondhand stories. But from what I understand, what they did was they had a second brush that was always damp with water on hand. And they would probably do it in a similar manner as me, so you don't need to keep washing in between colors. I think that was the way that it was utilized. Please don't quote me on it. All I'm saying is that my technique of using water very quickly to feather is nothing new. It's just that it's something that's a little bit harder to do. Although I do feel that it's actually, frankly, probably easier than wet blending. Wet blending is where you have two different paints. Both of them are still wet. It's trying to work together with them. And that I feel is a little bit harder simply because sometimes when you're using different paints, especially from different paint lines, they actually dry at slightly different times. So you may have a situation where where one layer is drying faster than the other even though you may have applied the other layer later than the first layer uh, it's a little bit of a mess so even though i have done a lot of wet blending in the past i still do use wet blending from time to time for example on the potion bottle of my ogre man eater from one of my previous tutorials i don't necessarily use it as often as i once did and for the most part nowadays i do enjoy doing feathering but again you gotta be fast that's one of the key things about it if you try and you fail don't be disheartened the speed and the control does come with a little bit of practice and again if you need it to be a little bit slower you can always use a little bit of retarder although again i must stress not too much every once in a while when you're feathering you're going to make mistakes and these mistakes, of course, they are going to stand out a little bit when you look at them initially. But always remember two things. Number one, if you have any subsequent layers that you're going to be building up on top of it later on, what you can do is you can feather those layers to help cover some of your earlier mistakes. If the mistake is very small and the mistake occurred at the interface between the, the colors that you're trying to cover, of course, you can always just go back and repaint it. There's no harm and no shame in that. So I'm using this squid pink all over the model. Whenever there is going to be the walnut purple from earlier, I will be using this as the highlight for the color. You see me working it on the shoulder pads as well fairly quickly and sometimes you get these tight strokes when you are doing feathering you always wash your brush a second time and do it one more time work while the paint is still wet and it should be fine likewise down here so you use this technique of course it's going to be fairly fast because even though you're not pre-mixing any paints anywhere what you're doing is you're essentially just 
blending the colors together. It's acting like a little bit of a filter. Now, at this point, I want to show something that's a little bit interesting. You will have noticed that right now I am using a mixture of Wallet Purple and Squid Pink. That's because I noticed that the color transition from the Squid Pink to the Wallet Purple was a little bit too stark. It was a little bit jarring and I didn't really like it. So in this case, I decided to mix them and do a transition paint in between. And you see this happening all the time with a lot of paint jobs. You will notice that people, sometimes they do this with airbrush as well where they have a shade or maybe a base coat and they do a very bright highlight and then they go back with the intermediate color. I also did this in my previous tutorial with Tyranids where I had of course my purple base coat and I also used a pink highlight but in between I added in the intermediate color of Wallet Purple. I'm noticing that by accident I'm doing a lot of purple color schemes. I actually don't have very many purple models in my collection but I guess it's just a ridiculous coincidence I'm doing two purplish pink based tutorials back to back. And now I'm using full grim pink as a highlight for the, well, pinks and the purples. So focusing on edges, you can see sometimes you make mistakes, right? You see down there, I just pushed a bit too much. And if the paint is still wet, just wash it off. Again, I'm not using any retarder in this situation. Oh, I'm just painting it straight from the pot, undiluted. Well, I kind of lied down there in a sense. Here's the thing, GW paints are super thick. When we buy them off the shelf, they are basically poop. So what I do is I just tend to add a lot of water into the pots. I also sometimes do add a little bit of just medium, acrylic medium, and I paint in them in the pots. How much do I add? Well, there's no fixed amount. Basically, I just fill it almost to the brim so that it's not overflowing. I find that that works for me. Your mileage may vary. And one important thing to keep in mind about pre-mixing in pots is that, well, first of all, over time, it's going to still continue drying. So you may need to top it up from time to time, but you can't top it up forever. As you keep topping up your paint pots with solvent, be it acrylic thinner or water, you're essentially diluting the amount of your pigment that's left available in the pot. So if you're not careful, you're going to of course have issues with the opacity of the paint. Secondly, bacteria and whatnot can grow in water. You'll be surprised to find that if you have too much water in your paints and you've been using it over too many years, your paint may start smelling funny and you may start observing funny things in your paint kind of growing there. This is of course a very extreme case, right? Uh, most people would never see this because paint is not the most conducive environment for things to grow in. All right, so for the shades, I'm going back with the Nagaroth and I'm adding the shades. Again, you'll notice that in this case, I am going to feather the shade over the base coat, over the highlight. It's kind of a reverse of what I did with the green just now. I'm using this to kind of blend the purples in a little bit more together. Now, you're asking yourself, Professor, could you have gone the other way around? where you started with the shades first and did the highlights later on, you can, you definitely can. I figured what was more important to me was to make sure that the color was sufficiently bright. That was very important to me. As a result, I worked on the highlights first and then I went with the shades. But again, you can do it any direction you want. It's perfectly fine. By the way, all this talking about moss and bacteria is also one of the big reasons why I don't use a wet palette too much. For those of you who've left the wet palette for too long, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, my wet palette looks fine. I've been leaving it moist for months without any issue. Oh, do I have news for you? Mm, please, please, please wash your wet palettes. So one of the interesting things about my choice of color down here is the fact that you will remember that I also used this purple to shade my greens. 
right? So this color kind of ties the model together in a uniform manner because the shade of my pinkish purple areas and the shade of my green areas are actually the same. They are literally the same paint. So of course, I'm working in the purples wherever I feel that there should be shadows, where it should be darker. And in my case, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going off my gut feel and logic where I perceive the shadows are going to be. But you can also, as I said, with either a gloss varnish or harsh and or harsh lighting, you can of course see where the shadows are supposed to be. You also notice that periodically I change my brushes. Sometimes I use a bigger brush, sometimes I use a smaller brush. It really depends on what I'm trying to do. So in this situation here, of course, I'm painting something that's very small, it's very narrow, so I'm going to be using the smallest brush that I have. People sometimes ask me, what brushes do I use? And well, I have something along the range of like 30 brushes. Again, I also have a problem where I buy too many brushes simply because I like to experiment with brushes but I like to experiment with paints, don't be like me. Just use whatever brush is comfortable, which you find is practical. I, for the most part, use a lot of nylon brushes for much of my painting, well, painting career, I guess. There's no career about that, I'm not a professional painter. But there's nothing wrong with nylon brushes. So now I'm going to be using Contrast Red and I'm mixing this with a little bit of satin varnish. So I mentioned in one of my previous tutorials that you don't need to tint your contrast paints with contrast medium. It doesn't tint so well with water though, admittedly. So as you can see, even with the contrast paint, it still picks up some of the highlights I did earlier on with the Warlord purple as well as the purple. You can see, of course, that, well, the contrast paints, when sufficiently tint, still show the underlying colors pretty well. Now using Off-White from Vallejo, I'm doing some tip highlighting. I'm just basically putting small little dots where I, I perceive I want the most light to kind of represent this shiny, almost, I, I won't say metallic, but you know, shiny spandex-ish uniform that they're wearing. I don't even know what they're wearing, honestly speaking. But I just feel like an extra highlight would be great. I also use this off-white as the final highlight for the purple and pink parts of the model. So again, if you think about it, that means that the shades as well as the ultimate highlights of my green and my pinkish purples are the same. So that's basically the end product for the purples and the greens. Now let's move on. I'm using a mixture of Sunny Flash and Wine Red to further highlight the hair a little bit. Again, you can see that I'm using the same technique that I did earlier on for the kind of under highlighting that I did with the hair, where it looks almost like dry brushing, but there's still more paint on my brush than dry brushing. I'm just running my brush edge along the hairs. Now, this is another piece of advice for people who use a lot of dry brushing. Sometimes it's of course tempting to take just a big brush and just rub it all over the hair, but you'll notice that technique is going to be a little bit messy and it's not going to give you the outcome that you want. I also use this color for the face. And again, this is another example of me using similar colors throughout the entire model to kind of tie things a little bit better together. Now I'm using just Sunny Skin to kind of paint on more highlights. So I didn't really record it, but I'm basically doing this in two layers. And I'm still, of course, using feathering to blend it together. This is to build up a fairly, well, bright color complexion without being too pale. The last thing I want is for my wood elves to look like dark elves. Now, one step that I skipped, a fairly major one that I skipped in this video, is painting the eyes. Now, it's not that I didn't want to show it, but very frankly, there was just no way for me to record me painting the eyes. So, what I did for the eyes is basically, I painted on the mascara using the dark purple and then I painted on the iris using walnut purple again keeping similar colors and 
put a tiny little dot of white not just on the sides of the iris you know the sclera area but i also put a tiny little dot of the the white in or rather on top of the iris if you go to my instagram and you look at the picture you zoom in a little bit on the face you will notice that that extra dot in the iris actually just brings out the coloration a little bit more and again it's another situation where i'm using the same colors over and over again throughout my model to just kind of tie things together and now i'm using flate one flesh to paint on the highlights Now I'm using Man of White Highlight as the final highlight for the skin. Very, very gently feathering this into the skin. Again, I don't want the model to be too pale. So I'm focusing this more on just the edges and the tips where it will get the most light. So the cheekbones, the tips of the nose, as well as the eyebrows. I also noticed at this point that the model looked a little bit weird without eyebrows so I actually did paint on eyebrows later on using the same combination of turquoises that I'm going to be using for her horn. Now, I figured that since this model had a lot of greens and a lot of purples and I really had red, I wanted the horn to stand out a little bit more. I have no idea why she has a horn but let's go with it. So I'm purposely using something that's a little bit more in the blue shade but I didn't want something that's straight up blue. So I'm going with turquoise. So using the combination of paints down here, I start with just straight up turquoise to apply the base coat and you'll see me again feathering it in. Turquoises feather very nicely and very beautifully over black. This is one of the colors where I only needed a single layer to get the kind of intensity that I wanted and that was pretty nice. Building up the highlights on the turquoise with light turquoise now. Same thing, figuring out where the light is going to be. In this case, of course, the tip of the horn as well as the edges of the horn facing the light. I'm going to feather them together and turquoises, just like blues, they blend really well with feathering. And last but not least, I'm using the Para Blue, I believe, and adding yet another highlight to the horn. Focusing on subsequently narrower areas to catch the light. That catch the light. One other thing that I did not show myself painting is the leaf on her face. For the leaf on her face, if you look at the final image on my Instagram, you will notice that I actually kind of used the combination of all the colors that I've used in this model. So there's actually a little bit of turquoise, a little bit of red, a little bit of purple, a little bit of green down there. That's why the leaf looks a little bit, it looks very slightly psychedelic, however psychedelic I could get it to look. It doesn't look exactly like any other part in the model, but because I'm using the same colors throughout for the leaf, it kind of still works together with the model while still standing out. It doesn't look like an extension of her face or an extension of her bodysuit. So last but not least, just adding an off-white highlight to make her horn really shine. Now for the shades, of course, since the horn is predominantly blue, if I left it just down there with the black shadow, it's going to look fine. But why not give it more contrast? So I'm just using this very dark red, basically, as a final shade. And of course, feathering it in. This red helps kind of tie everything together because there's shades of purple on her face. Of course, her hair is going to be red. And it just kind of gives you that, that nice final look. So there you go. That's the model. I'm noticing now that it's a little bit grainy because my lights weren't on when I was recording it. But you can go ahead take a look at the brighter slightly better photographs on my instagram so this video has been helpful to any of you please do hit the subscribe button because i do intend to make many more tutorials and other videos covering things like how to play games and having more conversations and interviews with whoever would love to collaborate with me and of course all my social media links are down below and you can also feel free to support me on my coffee account as well thank you all and take care